world in 23 time zones. And they're able to take advantage of those alerts. And uh, some of our members have had life changing, you know, trades uh, just from one or two trades, let alone the other opportunities that come across on a monthly basis. So, you know, having trade the chain and working with Nick, who is our chief communicate, uh, chief community officer has, you know, the past year and a half since we founded the, uh, the, the, the community and the platform has been among the most rewarding work of my life. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to share it with the MetaFans community. Amazing. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it, man. Nick. Yeah. What a wind up there, Ryan. Um, and I think that also, <laughs> yeah. speaks so, follow to, that up, you know, Nick. <laughs> That also speaks to, you know, A, why, you know, holding the spaces with you guys is such a great idea. And and B, why I joined as well is because of the knowledge, experience and prowess of the founding team, which I think means a lot, especially in anything early stage, which now we're much uh, later than that. But, you know, when when we were kicking things off, it it meant so much. So my background uh, is a bit like Ryan's in the traditional finance world uh, at Deutsche Bank, but I was more so focused on innovation and startups for my career. So uh, most of my time at Deutsche Bank was spent in their innovation labs uh, doing deal flow for hundreds of startups as it pertained to legal, financial, equities, um, large data sets, big data, um, ML, AI, all sorts of fun stuff. So um, eventually I moved into founding my own startup, which was actually focused on sentiment. Um, It was called Sync at the time. Um, And we founded one of the first kind of sentiment data platforms uh, for retail back in 2017, which is how I met Alex, uh, Ryan's business partner and and one of the other co-founders. We were speaking on panels together uh, in in the circuit, you know, in the 2017, 2018 era. So that's how I met the guys. And uh, obviously working with startups, working with sentiment data sets, working in the crypto trading industry afforded me a a different kind of lens and 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 a larger community focus than most were at the time. And we kind of took the community feel and, and, and ran with it. And we're, we're more than just um, a data platform at this point, you know, more or less half of our value, if you want to call it that, comes from the community itself. So comes from knowledge share, comes from, um, you know, uh, the, the alerts that we give everybody, comes from, uh, you know, learning from each other. We have, we have trading experts from literally all over the globe in the community. Um, and to have all of them in one place is actually extremely meaningful um, and a great knowledge resource for anyone who's either coming in or wants to beef up their skills, um, you know, more so to an expert level. So that's a little bit about my background and why I joined Trade the Chain and a little bit about what we do. I love it. I love it. So, I mean, there's obviously a lot to go into around like Trade the Chain and but I think it's interesting to to note that, it's, you know, it's it's obviously not just at this point now, it's not just a an analytics tool, but it's, it's almost become its own kind of crypto market alpha group, just in terms of the the level of people that you have within the community and and the knowledge that they're sharing with everyone on a regular basis. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and what's crazy is organically, we were able to grow to having members across 23 time zones around the world without any real marketing, without any uh, real effort to put the platform out there. It was all word of mouth. And there are 24 time zones in the world, but only 23 of them are inhabited. So we have representation literally on a global scale. And our Discord community is truly 24-7. And having all those different perspectives and having all those different you know, points of view has made it so well rounded, and it's just been—it's been an incredible ride growing the community alongside Nick and my two co-founders and a couple other people we have on board. But uh, it's, it, as I said before, it's been among the most rewarding work of my life by far. Awesome. I, I, I completely agree with that, and I think like the way to describe all of our community members are just like very kind, dedicated nerds. Like people, we have moms, we have dads, we have. Uh, people who live by themselves. We have people with with massive families. We have day traders. We have swing traders, um, and everybody is is kind of learning in tune. And, and it's kind of fascinating to see 
different people teach different other other things after being in the community for so long and giving back. It's kind of this like recycle of, you know, one person comes in and learns a ton and eventually gives it to that person. And then they end up helping, you know, the next batch of newcomers in. Um, and it's kind of a fascinating experience. And I've been in the crypto industry for four or five years. I learn things in chat all the time and I gather mm -hmm. new tools from our community members, um, both for my trading, for my research, um, for NFTs, like there's one person who kind of just dove into NFTs like four months ago and is now just dishing out all sorts of tools and research. Um, so, you know, it's just fascinating to watch people grow when you give them, you know, a great set of tools and then, you know, yeah. the ability to actually, you know, use those tools uh, constructively. So that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I see a lot of I, I feel like it resonates a lot what you're saying about the diversity of the community and and how there's so many different types of people. I, I feel like MetaFans also is very much like that, both in terms of we have so many different backgrounds that are in there, so many different sort of, you know, levels of experience. And we see that same thing of kind of, you know, that that new every time that new wave of people comes in, there's that old wave that keeps helping and then the new wave becomes the old and then they start helping the new. And it's a really amazing thing to watch. Um, like seeing a digital community be built. And I think that's one of the reasons why why we vibe so well together, because um, I think we're both building something very similar in that regard. What, what, I think what surprised me most, and um, I, maybe you've seen this also in your community, is that diversity, right? Like we have everything from college students just day trading and swing trading to retirees with millions of dollars, you know, all with different goals, different outlooks and different points of view and different uh, investment objectives. But they're all within the community and they're all sharing that knowledge and one thing that I, I think Nick would agree with me on is that our community is uniformly positive. There's no negativity. There's no uh, trolls. There's no uh, spam accounts. And, you know, we have positions of leadership. And it's just it's the most positive community that's been fostered that I've ever been part of in an online environment. And you have know, you been I'm, to MetaFans? No. <laughs> <laughs> What I was going to say is that I'm so happy we're able to share that with the MetaFans community because I yeah. really do feel like there's such a great like uh, synergy between what we're trying to build and what you're trying to build and what I've gleaned from your community. And I'm just um, – we're, we're happy we're here. Absolutely. Yeah. No, same same here. And I know, you know, a lot of people here are – they're here to they're here to learn and we'll, we're going to start getting into – the meat and potatoes of this discussion, which is, I think, number one, talking about what some of those tools are and how they can be used. But even more so than that, like, I think it's actually very interesting timing, you know, serendipitously uh, for this discussion, just due to how the markets have been trending over the last couple of days and what we've experienced uh, from a crypto perspective over the last, say, what, two months? Is it, Ryan? What, been... like, what, what's going on? How... You know, and maybe you can tie together a little bit around kind of state of the market, how and how you're perceiving it, but also how are you analyzing it, and what are what are some of those tools that you're using that are help you, helping you drive those decisions? I would actually defer to Nick on this. He's more of a technical trader and more of a, a research analyst than I am. I'm more of a a, a bigger picture and ideas guy. Like I think Nick can better articulate how he uses the platform on a daily basis and how. He yeah, does that's all. Trading and swing trading right. and all of that. So I would absolutely defer to him on this. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll just kick you to the side, Nick. <laughs> yeah, Ryan's, Ryan's in the big leagues. He doesn't need to uh, to day trade anymore like he used to. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I think just in the in general, and I think just as the first point, um, you know, at the very least, to just keep up with our opinions and our thoughts on the market. Um, is if you do sign up for Trade the Chain, that'll automatically get you signed up for our weekly newsletter where we cover basically, you know, give a nice market synopsis every Monday evening. Um, and I, I don't want to gloat, but we did more or less, you know, kind of call the bottom um, about two weeks ago based on a few major stats that we follow. And that is along with sentiment, market data, exchange flows, minor flows and all sorts of fun stuff. So 
Um, I'll just let everybody know that kind of our big stat last week was both a sentiment change, one that was we were seeing basically bearish sentiment for weeks and weeks and weeks. Sometimes it would, you know, catch it. It would it would uh, Bitcoin sentiment and Ethereum sentiment would catch, you know, some fresh air and, and get its head above water. But more or less, it was red um, and bearish for, you know, the, the few months where we saw the downturn. Eventually, about two weeks ago, we started to see more bullish than bearish, which is, you know, we're starting to see a reversal in opinion. People are obviously still on the fence, but we're starting to see the positivity start to outweigh the negativity. So that was one of the biggest signs that we saw. Obviously, that's trackable through Trade the Chain. And we have both one day charts and seven day charts for you to track that um, on an hourly and daily sense. So that's very valuable. Quick um, question, Nick. How, yes. So how, like, what was, at what point were you able to start tracking that? And in terms of like the the buffer time between you starting to see that sentiment versus when things started to pick up or was it sort of simultaneous or, or was there that buffer period in between, even if it was just a, a couple of hours or 24 great, hours? Great question. Nick, this, so is a great, wanted... Nick, Nick, this is a great, this is a great opportunity to explain why sentiment is often a leading indicator yep. and to kind of illustrate that point, I think. For sure. And I, and I want to set the tone before I dig into that based on, you know, macro and micro, uh, you know, uh, views on the market. Macro is generally multi-week, dipping into multi-month, whereas micro would be multi-day uh, within a week. So, you know, for sentiment trends, and we often trade on these, you know, that you can use them hour by hour. What I'm discussing right now is a bit more of macro as a, as a week to week basis. So, um, you know, what I generally look for is just the daily trend. So if Bitcoin does become bullish, is it literally for an hour um, or is it for a sustained period of time? And, and in the case of this bearish trend, it was nearly every day, 24 hours a day, Bitcoin was bearish or, in, or neutral, which means it was just barely peeking its head above water. So so seeing that sustain for weeks on end means, OK, traders are bearish. You know, there's no reason to to flip out or, or start, um, you know, preparing my trades. Eventually, okay. when you start to see, uh, you know, Bitcoin sustained on, on, a, on a bullish with bullish sentiment for more than 12 hours, near 24 hours and then dip back down, you're like, OK, you know, we're starting to reverse the trend. Traders are starting to step in. They're starting to get euphoric at certain points in the market. Now, what shook my mind and what what made me dig deeper into the data at that point in time was the mere fact that we'd seen three days four days five days of bullish data whereas we'd been seeing you know that same side but on bear so now that we're starting we're so starting wait, to wait, see wait, really price... really quick go on ahead. that four during that say like and we're talking we're talking we're talking about this was all recent right like during this, this is like about two weeks ago yeah right so you're saying during that four day straight of bullish sentiment where we hadn't seen that during this like multi-month um yes. you know bear market at that point in time even with that four straight day of bullish sentiment we hadn't actually seen the prices rise yet is that right no what, what we saw and if you look at the chart was volatility uh near that 30k you know uh price point we we dipped back and hit 30k multiple times but what changed is we were now trading in a range now if you're taking sentiment and immediately porting it over to technical analysis if you're seeing you know six days out of seven bearish you're on a bearish trend if you're right. seeing three to four days bearish out of a week now you're starting to get volatile in a range now you're flip-flopping back and forth you have no real push in either direction so seeing sentiment start to reflect what was also being happening on the chart meaning that we, when sentiment was uh, and, and you'll see this a lot sometimes when um uh price gets exactly near support which was you know a lot of times around that 30k number we'd start to see sentiment pick up because traders start to get euphoric and rally and they start to get excited this doesn't always happen but you start to see trends shift around the key points of the range in which Bitcoin or any other asset is trading. So if sentiment starts to flip a little bit bullish while we're on it, while we were just after a downturn, that to me is a striking signal that, you know, we are we may be in store for a price reversal and you start digging deeper into the data. Now, that's more of a microcosm. Now I'm digging. Now I'm going to go back to macro. But you you understand what I'm saying. Six days out of seven is bearish. Now it's four days out of seven is bearish. Now it's two days out of seven is bearish. And all of a sudden, trader trader opinion and outlook starts to become bullish and then what do you see uh you start to see 
bear, uh, bullish news pop up in the news. You start to, right. you know, obviously we just had Tesla and other things, but then you start to see small things pop up that start to solidify these opinions and these feelings that you're seeing on the charts. And then you start to form a thesis of what may be happening at a macro level that a reversal may occur. And what I wrote about was in addition to sentiment, we started, we saw massive, massive outflows of both miners and exchanges. And that, and that had happened before when we saw the same sentiment patterns before Bitcoin had its meteoric rise a year ago up to its previous high. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you see these things happen in correlation and then you come to our community and we discuss these at length and start to talk about, you know, all sorts of other exchange and, and minor uh, flows and things like that, then it starts to, you start to really, you know, talk about Ryan piecing the puzzle together. And that's when you really, you know, that's when you have that kind of aha moment. Obviously, nothing is ever for certain, but that's what traders do. We make inferences based on the data we have um, and trade the chain offers, you know, a very wide varying uh, array of data. So. So, so also, and Nick, Nick, not to cut you off, I'm sorry, Nuggles, uh, but I think it's not only important to know when to buy, perhaps, or have sure. an idea of when to buy, but looking at sentiment data also enables you to have a general idea of when to potentially sell, yeah? True, exactly. So let's say uh, you, uh, sentiment is too euphoric, you know, for no one, nothing, no rally is ever sustained, and this is, you know, a good, a good idea. Uh, a way to flip flop the the uh, flipping or flip flop the finding the bottom on its head, meaning you know finding the top. If sentiment is bullish for weeks on weeks, or it's bullish six days out of seven, something is you know hmm you know maybe the the giant might fall a little bit. Maybe you know maybe we might we might take a nap on the price chart for a little bit. So if sentiment is too high for too long, that's a great signal. Um, and it's and also we have hourly charts. So if you see sentiment is high on the daily and it's just been too high for too long and you know that a reversal may be coming because nothing can be sustained in, in one direction forever. Then you go on the hourly chart and that gives you exactly what's happening within a 24 hour set, a very short term set. And then if that is flipping bearish, then you've got a really good reason that a top is amongst because short term traders are, are flipping on its head um, and you've been bullish for way too long. So obviously something has to fall. So that is a really good way to do that. Also, uh, lack of volume. volume. So we can sort by volume on the trade the chain uh, dashboard. So if a coin has a complete lack of volume. Um, and it's been trading higher for a while, or maybe it's just been sitting in a range for a while and volume disappears. Um, well, then you know that, you know, people are not trading it um, and it, people are likely to sell because there's less interest and we are in kind of an interest driven trading economy, um, as well as if there's less volume, whales can push the price around, which makes it a lot more of a risky investment and something that is very useful to know if you're putting cash in something for a short or long period of time. So there's a few ways that you can use trade the chain your advantage to both find a top and a bottom because we have both long term and short term indicators that pair very well with each other in addition to the exchange stuff. Got it. So that is all obviously, ex I mean, very powerful stuff, very powerful tools. I have, I feel like a number of follow-up questions that I want to ask on some of that. So first, the first piece is you were talking about um, selling off of miners. Are you talking about basically minor cryptocurrencies that are, that are moving and we're seeing the flow go to the Bitcoins and Ethereums of the world? Yeah, so this was a topic that I wrote about. That so we subscribe to other data sets that we share with our community, um, and then just so that you know we have to form many pieces uh, or have to have many pieces of the pie um, to make sure that we're making the best inferences. So we paired the sentiment data with seeing um, minor outflows, and the miners are you know Ant Pool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, they're gonna, of course, all of the miners are gonna escape my mind right now. But if you go and you know Google, you know Bitcoin miners globally, you, you can very much find a, a pie chart that'll tell you which percentage of the BTC mining pools are owned by who, um, or, or I guess control the hash power because it's not really owned by anybody. But um, you can track where or if they're selling or if they're offloading, if they're transferring their crypto. Everything's public on the blockchain. So if Got the it. miners Money. are moving crypto to you know some sort of cold storage wallet or something like that um that's very valuable info because they are foreseeing that as bullish or maybe they're moving that to an exchange which could be right. perceived as bearish um because anything if adding liquidity to exchanges is seen as a is a move to to maybe offload crypto so um we saw a lot of crypto move off exchanges 
by chance as well, which was very interesting. So crypto moving off exchanges means that you are um, your, your pr price action is more likely to be bullish because there's less liquidity on exchanges to trade. Right. Um, so. Got it. Under understood. And and so when you also talk about some of like these. The being able to form more macro hypotheses around what's going on in the market um, with with all of the kind of crawling that you're doing to be able to determine the sentiment. Are you are you also able to understand some of those key kind of phrases or or thoughts or concepts that are maybe driving um, that sentiment? So, for example, if we're if we're in a bearish market, like is regulation something that you can identify that's sort of the causing the, the, the macro level of bearish market? Yeah, so uh, it, it, it's tough to ever pinpoint one exact thing to the cause. Obviously, you know, I think traders have been trying to deduce news to price action for as long as we've had markets. It's just we, we are able to do it a lot more um, instantaneously. So, you know, I, let's just take the example of um, e or Tesla saying that they held one point nine billion on the balance sheet. Um, and then we had another bang, bang piece of news um, or Valkyrie actually had launched their miners ETF. Speaking of miners, Valkyrie and ETFs. So we had a bang, bang piece of news. Um, sentiment actually rose before price action that morning, the very early into the morning. You could actually see it ascending. Um, before it had a massive spike in the morning, which to anybody who watches sentiment on a daily basis, if that's ascending into the trading day, that's a pretty darn good sign. So obviously we had those news updates in our community. Um, most people were aware of them just because they made national news quickly. Um, but sentiment was rising before the news really broke globally. Um, and if you were watching the sentiment charts, you would have realized that something was happening and that you should either be paying attention to the news or prep some trades or just, you know, make a trade just for, for your, your risk reward percentage based on your success rate with trade the chain. So, um, you know, it's never like, Hey, you know, Tesla buys 1.9 million in crypto, like sentiment is immediately going up here because nothing is ever immediately one-to-one. -one. Um, and the fortunate fact about the sentiment stuff is whispers always happen online with crypto um, and tracking sentiment allows you to kind of hear those whispers, you know, it, you know, in the other room, so to speak, because you can see sentiment becoming more euphoric before the news actually breaks. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think one way of looking at it, right? Like as human beings, it's really hard to remove the emotion from trading. We'd like to think that we can, but mm -hmm. we, we can't. Sometimes we get hooked into a, a emotionally invested in a project. And what our platform and our data enables is to allow people, to individuals, to remove the emotion from trading by trading on other people's emotions, right? And I think that that's, that's a really, really powerful tool because we're able to quantify what people are thinking and feeling and saying into a score that enables you to make a more informed decision on where you want to deploy your dry powder. Yeah, you know, that's that that's it's the most powerful tool I've come across. And even if I wasn't a co-founder, this is something that just just paying attention to sentiment scores and paying attention to the momentum that I see on the platform. I, I look at the sentiment scores on it every morning and I'll I'll day trade or swing trade something and trades that I would never be able to think of on my own just by relying on the data I've been able to make and more often than not they pan out. Um and you know, it's just, it's, it's been, it, it, it really is an incredible of, uh, knowledge and information uh, that people should try out. And this is uh, Doug, guys. I'm finally here. My Nokia flip phone started to uh, finally uh, work. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, look you at that. up the yeah. razor after all these years. Hey, man, the cell, the cell signal in Jupiter, Florida is not what it should be. Um, but just to compliment what Nick and Ryan were just saying, um, when you think about it, back in the day, the trading floors in Chicago and New York, um, there was an audible noise, right? People would hear that. And we're actually uh, publishing a piece on Medium that we talk about this. It's the same thing, right? People would, would sense where the direction was and that noise would get louder and louder and louder. And that was sentiment, right? It was how people felt 
And now we're trading off the same thing, right? Emotions. We're just able to quantify it with a score using data mining and artificial intelligence and all these new technologies that we have. But we're not really, you know, creating a new wheel, uh, so to speak. We're just uh, tweaking, let's say, the old one. But this, this is what guys did back on the day. Uh, this is why specialists obviously made a, a tremendous amount of money on the New York Stock Exchange. They were tuned in. To the, to the sounds that were on the trading floor, right? And that was uh, a, an inner circle, like let's say like the bowels of the trading floor that most retail play traders just didn't have access to. And so right. now we're able to provide that to the community at large, which is really exciting. So, and, and let's face it, the retail community has always been underserved in markets. And so now this is a chance for the retail community to have you know access to institutional type of information. So uh, we're super excited about it. Doug, oh, that's awesome. Doug, you, I think you're dating both you and I uh, by talking about being on an open pit trading floor. <laughs> I thought I was dating myself with a Nokia flip phone, but okay. <laughs> I, I love wow. the, I mean, like, the. I think that, like, part of uh, this whole world that we're living in, and I think it started in probably, like, the, maybe the early to mid-2010s, and it's been growing now with Web3 and blockchain, is just the democratization of different things for people at large. I mean, whether you Airbnb, Uber, and now we're seeing it, you know, you guys are doing it with financial data um, that was only privy to, you know, very select group, like you just said, and give and handing that power and empowering, uh, you know, the community around us, I think is, uh, I think is amazing. So I, um, I'm, I'm curious also about, you know, there's, we're, we're starting to see a rebound now, but back to my point around, you know, regulation, there have been, you know, discussions, there's been articles coming out from, from the government, there have been, you know, uh, meetings with Congress, there's a lot of chatter. What, what do we think the, the rest of the year's outlook looks like with that sort of looming over the, the market? I think before uh, we get into that outlook, right, I think it's fair and important to point out that regulation isn't necessarily a bad thing. It brings clarity and it lets the larger participants in the market know the guardrails in which they have to play, right? And if we want this industry and this market to go where everyone expects it to go and where everyone has been talking about it going for years now, we need institutions to be part of it and they can't Agreed. be part of it until they, until they understand how they can be part of it. Otherwise it's just you and I and our friends and a few funds playing with money in our basement. And I, I think in, uh, regulation and clarity on, around that regulation, because in my interactions with the U S regulators and with regulators abroad, they've been mostly collaborative. They've been mostly positive. They've been curious and they've, they've been, pragmatic in their approach and they want to get this right regulation is inevitable so trying Correct. to fight it is, is it's, it's futile but i think that we have an opportunity as an industry to help educate the authorities and help them create rules and regulations that foster innovation rather than stifle it and no one's going to 100 percent like where it ends up however it's a necessary evil and I think it's a good thing. And oh, yeah. I, so Ryan, just so you know, from a regulation yeah. perspective, I don't, I definitely don't mean for it to come off as regulation is negative because I oh, very much not. believe in what you that, believe yeah. and that regulation yeah. is one of the main paths towards, you know, wide scale adoption, which is in everybody's yeah, best yes. interest. Mm -hmm. However, I think regulation at like the, you know, the normal retail investor level is is uncertainty and uncertainty scares people. And back to sentiment, I, I, I feel like un the uncertainty will potentially drive sentiment down. Um, so it's, it's fascinating to me to see the rebound that's going on now with, you know, that, that's still looming over just because of the uncertainty behind mm -hmm. it all. I think that, that, that drive down would only be temporary, right? Like it would yeah. be a new work reaction, kind of like the COVID crash. And then things will recover. I, I, that's that's my point of view. It doesn't mean I'm right, but you know, just through yeah. the lens that I have and the access to information through trade the chain, through institutions that I work with, I feel like that would be the 
the ultimate end game there. Nick, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think the fortunate part about having a community that is founded by experts who have been in traditional and crypto markets for decades uh, combined, millennia combined, um, is, you know, it, it gives you... <laughs> uh, it gives you it gives you perspective on events like that and and market structure and how it looks. So if, if I was if we were to get an immediate, you know, uh, regulatory proposal that would actually like make the industry have to change a lot of its operational structure, i.e., accounting, uh, basic ops, you know, the breakups of certain exchanges, then we have a black swan event and that black swan event would draw us down likely 50% potentially more. Um, But it would likely breed long-term stability because everyone would be synced up. There potentially could be a global standard. Um, You know, there's more clarity. Now everybody knows how to move the, the the billionaires that haven't gotten in now have an idea about getting in because everything's at a discount. Um, So we know how these things operate. So if if there was to be a quote unquote black swan regulatory event, that's what would happen. But I think if we were to get what we expect, um, then there will just be a slight drawdown in price action while the industry adapts to the legislation that it is. Um, in a more slow and steady manner, which I think is more likely to happen. Um, so I think any regulation will likely breed potentially negative to neutral price action, meaning keeping us in a range to potentially downward price action. But it's long term very beneficial because of multiple reasons. A, the industry synced up. B, new money knows how to come in. C, prices are a little bit cheaper. So more people are attracted to the asset class as a whole. Um, we saw all of this happen in March 2020. Um, we just saw it on a grander scale with trillions more liquidity than we've ever seen. Um, so in this case, it would not be as volatile, but that's exactly what you would expect, you know, the charts or what, what you would expect to happen on the charts based on the various legislation that occurs. Um, I think that anything, any legislation that comes that doesn't ban or shackle the industry is good. I think anything that standardizes and adds structure is good. I know neither of those are specific and can be interpreted in many ways, but I would like to see the industry not have to stop and reset. I would like it to, um, I would like the industry to have to, to, to keep going with maybe more stringent rules um, associated with the allowance and, and protection of uh, retail investors and, and, and being able to get in the industry. Because I think crypto does represent a new epoch in investing and how we invest together. Um, Mm -hmm. But it does not mean that we need safe moons and come rockets and all of that, you know, running Mm -hmm. around and and pump and dumping people, you know? So um, there has to be a happy medium in there that allows people to make money. um, But also where people understand that this, that making money requires risk um, and that nothing is foolproof. So. And and lastly, sorry, Doug, sorry, not not to cut you off. Um, But I also think it's worth pointing out that whenever any new rules or regulations are adopted, I was, uh, I'm old enough to remember when Sarbanes-Oxley was enacted. We had like, I don't know, 18 months at the Swiss bank I was working at to comply with that. So it's not going to be an overnight thing where the regulator says, okay, this is the rule. You have to comply tomorrow or next week or next month. You have like a 12, 18, sometimes even 24 month window in which you have to comply. So there might be a knee jerk sell off, but it'll probably level off in not too long a period of time, just like the equities markets did back then. And it won't, it'll just be a blip on the radar in the long term. It won't be anything that I would sell into, Um, you know? and I would, I would just add, lastly, that regulation is always from the lens of helping or benefiting the retail investor. You look at over the last 20 years, uh, the stock market equities went from frac- fractions to decimals, right, or decimalization. Why was that? Because that gave the retail investor, you know, cheaper price points. Obviously, online brokerage commissions, you know, have dropped pre- precipitously. Again, that was uh, to benefit the online investor, more transparency and mutual fund marketing fees. So all this regulation that is going to happen, like Ryan said, it's inevitable. It's a good thing. But you think about it, it will certainly benefit the ecosystem, not not picking on any of the firms that we all use um, that are based here in the U.S., for instance, that are exchanges. Um, but the commissions are egregious, right? I mean, 2% spreads are humongous. Like those are things that certainly have to come in. Um, there's a firm that, you know, uh, that I've used that charges $150 just to get your money back, right? Like oh. that, that shouldn't occur, right? That's just, um, and, th- and so obviously there's things there that 
will benefit the retail investor. So you'll have obviously some some fee compression on commissions and things and spreads obviously as well. Um, also, there's going to be some need for at least more clarity around yield farming and and stable coins, right? Why are, why is somebody getting 9% on USDC right now when cash on cash in a money market doesn't even earn 1% um, right. you know, at a Chase Bank, right? So these are good things that will happen, um, but there's obviously a, a lot of answers that, um, like Ryan said in the beginning, preclude the real money, the big money institutional investors to come in. Um, but, but all in all, it's a good direction we're going in. Absolutely. Um, I want to call out. I know that, that we've got at least one person who's requested to jump up as a speaker. We'll get we'll get there soon. I promise. We'll uh, we'll be wrapping up some of just the discussion here, and then we would love for people to to come up and start asking questions. Um, so, I mean, I think the last point before um, you know we can turn the discussion a little bit uh, towards NFTs um, for a few minutes before we uh, before we open the floor, and you know there might be an opportunity for us to just host another one of these and, and keep having some of these discussions. I hope uh, that I hope this so. yeah. far has been beneficial for those who have been sitting in here and listening in. Um, so uh, I guess the, the, the only, the last thing that I kind of want to ask, and I feel like folks here might be wondering this themselves is, you know, you have a widespread of, of, you know, of, what people are are willing to to invest you know you have people that have a thousand dollars in liquidity and you've got people with a million plus in liquidity that they want to that they want to play around in the market and mm -hmm. and would you say that you know it really doesn't matter um you can if, if you work to to learn how to use these tools they can be just as beneficial for for the smaller retail investor versus the whale oh absolutely right like what we always tell our community is any profitable trade is a good trade. Don't let anyone profit shame you. Don't let anyone tell you that you're insignificant because we don't all have the same resources. We're not all at the same, I guess, level financially or uh, part of the journey. Yeah, exactly. It, it takes it takes a while to get where you want to be. And, you know, when I first started out in crypto, I was investing $25, $50, $100 a week, depending on how much I went out drinking with my friends. And <laughs> it just, it, it takes time to get where you want to be. It takes discipline. And don't let anyone tell you that you're not investing enough or doing enough or you're not making enough, right? We all have to start somewhere. And it's all about building that foundation and working your way up from there. So absolutely 100%. Uh, anyone at any stage of life, at any point in their investing journey, they can they can be part of MetaFans. They can be part of the chain. It, it, you you have to start somewhere, one hundred percent. And that's what community is for. It's to help you educate, help educate you, and help you learn, and help build you up to a point where you're now returning the favor and you're paying it forward. But we all start somewhere for sure. Awesome. Um, thank you, Ryan. So so with that, we can change the we can kind of move a little bit into NFTs. Uh, we don't have to spend, you know, as much time. And like I said, we can find more time together to maybe dive into this a little bit. But so from mm -hmm. the NFTs perspective, that's not a, a, like from a, from your platform's perspective, that's not a, a, a huge component as of right now, correct? It isn't right now, but what we're working on and we're going to roll out some new features in the not too distant future that we're, that we have in development now um, that includes sentiment around NFTs. Right. So we have sentiment around coins, but we're starting to develop the capability to get sentiment around different NFT projects as well. And I think that is going to be, uh, you know, that's something that would absolutely resonate with uh, with with your with your uh, community. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, for for you and, and you know, Nick and, and Doug, what has been your personal exposure to the NFT world so far? Um, I'll let Nick speak to his uh, because it's quite extensive. I, I own a couple dozen NFTs across uh, a handful of projects, but I think Nick is definitely a bit more qualified to speak on this than I am. Um, well, I appreciate that. Uh, and um, <laughs> my my experience is not ultra long. Like I'm not an NFT punk bake era OG, but I got very, very deep over the summer of 2021 uh, and, and still now. 
So my experience started with just, you know, some small timing, just, you know, dipping my toes in, but then, um, you know, got really heavy and started buying bakes and doges um, and pudgy penguins. And I got really deep into kind of all that lore, um, everything that happened with Wolf Game and studying all of, oh, the, yeah. all of the clones and stuff like that. But I also founded a project called Potty Punks. We got featured in Bloomberg uh, very organically. Our, our community members were interviewed without any of our not without any of our knowledge or help or anything like that too. So that was really cool. Um, so I we, I currently also run a community of, of over four thousand um, NFT nuts as well. Um, so that's fun. And I don't I, I'm not as deep in the game as much anymore, but I keep up with it as much as possible. Um, and I have a few websites that I can toss to people at the end, too, is some 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 cool ones to to track NFTs and stuff like that as well. So um, I, I try to keep up with it, but I'm not as deep anymore. I got rid I like I sold my mutant ape around uh, the first run uh, right after Christmas and actually made a really pretty penny on it. Uh, but I, that was my probably my last big trade. Um, and then I've, I own a bunch of various stuff all the way from, you know, groupies to, to pudgy penguins um, and some other uh, obscure classic, uh, you know, wannabe blue chip NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, so it's funny. You like wannabe blue chip. So it's I, I think that it's a it's an interesting time right now when you kind of look at where the NFT world is uh, compared to like the ICO craze. Um, It, it, I feel like it's a little similar right now with like the amount of noise and saturation and things that are popping up. I mean, do you agree with that sentiment? Oh, certainly. And I think it's like, it's very tough to get in as a new person um, in and understand everything because it's literally information overload. Like if, if you yeah. if you were a computer, you would not be able to process the amount of information being thrown at you just by the the, the, the sheer, you know, limits of, of our body. <laughs> um, and I think that's the, the biggest thing that I go back to is community. And I, I tell everybody who wants to get into anything and I'm like, you have, this is the, the suckiest part is finding the community that you vibe with and that will help you along because that is really going to be your support group moving forward. And it sounds like you guys have that with meta fans. Um, and, you know, I love, I, I love these conversations that we can share some NFT data and stuff like that too. Cause I do track, um, a lot of open source data sets for NFTs, you know, specifically on um, OpenSea because that's where a lot of trading happens and stuff. So um, I'd love to, you know, we can dig into some data and stuff this evening as well if, um, you know, if we have some extra minutes. Yeah, absolutely. And I, it's, I don't know, it's, it's interesting with where things are headed right now. I mean, also the the whole concept of what what's going on in the NFT market, depending on you know, where Ether is, is going and, and where it's at and tracking the um, kind of what I think it looks like a bit of an inverse relationship uh, between, oh, you know, the price of ETH and then where NFT markets are going. So, I mean, like December and January were, were just massive months from like a volume perspective in the NFT market. And, and, and then not only that, but the, the fascinating thing about we're, like the trends behind what we're seeing with NFTs right now is the rapid sort of wising up of consumers and consumer behavior um, where people are learning pretty quickly. And, um, and I don't know if, uh, if the market is necessarily giving those folks enough credit. Um, it's a very different market. Uh, now than it was in September or October when, you know, every project that was popping up was, was selling out within minutes. Um, and not only that, but we're moving from what was a, a very like PFP type of environment in Q3. And I think we're now moving towards a very combo of utility focused and, and, and sort of uh, t- like token and economy focused um, world with NFTs, at least for the near future, I think for probably at least the next six months before that be- that next big innovative wave happens. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see where the market goes, especially with ETH going back up. But 
Yeah, um, you're completely right. Like we we actually plotted East price, price and NFT volume booms in the community a while back to see if there was a correlation. We shared this with the community. It was a very interesting discussion. Um, but there was a complete inverse relationship. I think there, there was a period where ETH went up and in, in, uh, the NFT market boomed. There was a period where ETH went down and the NFT market boomed. Um, I think Ryan and I stared at that chart for like a day and could find like one kind of flimsy way to, to categorize it because each I think each boom did actually come after an ETH boom but the staggering of time after the boom was so different that it was almost like you know what do i do with this data anyway if even if i try to do something with it so it's funny you say that because we noticed the same thing um and it's funny you mentioned kind of what the meta is right now and i I, i'm using kobe's term that he coined um in one of his pieces that he wrote uh around christmas time and it was finding the meta and he used league of legends as an example because if anyone has played video games you all know that the guns or the characters that you use always get, you know, mixed and matched depending on who is the meta or who's the strong character for that period of time or that type of gameplay. Um, and right now in the NFT world, it was PFPs. Or, and, and, and now it's it's the tokenization of everything. So what I'm seeing are, are big brands get in. So Gucci, Nike, Adidas, that's the meta. Uh, partnerships are the meta. So RTFK, uh, or I'm probably botching that, 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 um, uh, whatever it is, but they, they're, they've got the clone X and stuff like that. So, um, and they're doing partnerships out the wazoo. So any, any company that's doing partnerships is big and then tokens. So you, you see right. fake exploded because they're doing tokens allegedly soon or, or allegedly doing tokens at some point. I don't know. Um, but every, everything that's launching has a token because of the, what Wolf game and all of the game five games did to the NFT market and kind of trying to add some sort of, um, legitimate, you know, uh, of, uh, uh what's the word that i'm looking for game it's not game five but the gamification of of something in a, in a more statistical manner so um those are the three metas that i'm seeing right now if it has a token if it's a big brand name or if it if it has planned partnerships or, or is it has the ability to launch partnerships um those are pretty much the big trends that i'm seeing right now and in terms of like specific data that i'm seeing so we actually had like a repeat of the boom um, that we had about around August, but the last month's January's uh, total volume was 4.9 billion, whereas August's total volume was 3.4 billion. So that is 3.4 billion at a peak to 4.9 billion, and that's just on OpenSea. I, I'm I'm sorry, not right. all NFT volume, but that's just OpenSea. So you know this is where we're headed, and just what are we eight days into February? We are at 1.2 billion. So if we were to multiply that by four um we should be close to january's volume for the month of february if we keep pace right now which is good for the nft trend continuing it is especially with the market bouncing back yes and i think people i think this is my biggest hint to people who want to trade nfts so there's two types of nft people you know you either want to collect or you want to flip nfts and make money um, hopefully quickly. So right. collectors, you can probably ignore this advice, but if you would like to flip my biggest, the thing I pay most attention to is volume. And this, I pay attention to it just like on, I do on the price charts. If a coin has continued steady volume or increasing volume hour by hour or day over day, depending on the swing, the time frame that you want, um, that is a very good sign for continued price action in the same direction. Now, if it has waning volume, meaning that it is volume is disappearing hour by hour or day by day uh, and price is headed in the same direction, that is likely sign for a reversal. Uh, volume has generally for most of the time has to be sustained to continue a rally else anyone can step in and just tank the price because of a lack of volume. So um that's the biggest thing that I look for. So if you if you, someone tells you something's hot and you maybe hear about it two days late and price is still on the rise, but volume has decreased for two days, um, my advice is to wait. Um, and nine times out of 10, it is obviously nothing I ever say is going to be 100% correct, but it might save you um, to wait uh, if you get a quote unquote hot tip and volume is declining uh, day over day. Um, and that's probably my biggest advice to anyone watching or anyone kind of just stepping in track volume more often than not um it will it will serve you um well in the long term yep um i think uh next next time we get together we'll spend a little bit more time talking about the nft market and and what our overall outlooks are for for 2022 because 
I, I believe that this, I think part of the gamification thing you were talking about, I sort of, the way that I think about them are, are like micro, micro economies, basically. Um, everyone's trying to build their own little micro economy um, and see who can gather the, mo the, the most attention um, and, and, and users first. So we're, we're seeing folks go in that direction. I really think that that's going to be something that goes on for like the next three to six months. And then it's going to be the next wave of what that next kind of innovation is. So, I mean, we saw it like in the beginning, it was, you know, breeding and, and creating new things. And, and now it's turned into tokens and micro economies and there's going to be the next thing. And I, I, I think that Q3 of this year is probably going to be when that happens. Um, so yeah, well, I would, I would love to have further discussion on, on that and the NFT market. Um, next time we can all get together with our friends here. What I would love to do uh, now is open the floor for some questions. I know we've we've got a uh, French farmer who's been waiting patiently. I just called you up, and then anyone else, um, if you have questions for any of us that are that are up here, um, after just hearing some of the uh, the awesome stuff that we've had we've had everyone from Trade the Chain sharing, please uh, feel free to call yourself up. seeing if French Farmer can connect. Uh, it might not be going through. While we're waiting for French Farmer to connect, right, I just want to uh, echo a point that you made about NFTs and Q3. Uh, you know, a lot of what we're seeing, both anecdotally and from a, a data-based point of view, is that the crypto market itself is likely to trade, you know, sideways, at least for Q2. And then it's setting itself up for like a Q3 into Q4 rally. And, you know, some of the smartest people I know in the markets, people with, you know, blue chip pedigree backgrounds from like Guggenheim or Goldman or JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley, some of the bigger firms, uh, they, they all see, you know, a lot of projects, protocols, NFTs, they, they see them hitting new all-time highs before the end of this year. So I, I think that's a really smart point of view that you have on the markets. We're going to have a bit of pain between now and, say, the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, going into the fall and the winter, we should um, hopefully be rewarded for our patience. Correct. Um so I tried to get French Farmer back up, but it, it looks like he's not coming. Uh, I do want to open the floor one more time if there are any other folks that want to either either ask questions or just have their own thoughts um, or want to share anything. Please, uh, please jump on up. We'll give it a second to see if anyone wants to come on up. And in the meantime, also... If there's, uh, if there's any folks here that uh, are coming from from the Trade the Chain community or are coming in from elsewhere, um, just as a, a quick heads up in terms of who we are as meta fans, I mean, you should check out, uh, check out our Twitter, which has got links to our Discord, uh, as well as our website. Um, we're obviously an, an NFT project. We're focused on bringing together sports and entertainment fans um, and building community, empowering our community, giving back to charity and, and continuing to build innovative technology in the Web3 space. Um, doing stuff like this is super important to us uh, to continue to empower our community with education as well as through uh, the in real life experiences that we that we look to provide games, tickets to events. Uh, we're hosting a Wrigley uh, Field Super Bowl party this Sunday that's exclusive to Meta fans. Uh, as long as you own one. So try to, trying to do a lot of uh, cool stuff for our community. Um, we built an incredible one. If you go check out our Discord, you'll see that yourself. So uh, shameless plug for ourselves, just uh, to give a brief intro to who we are for folks that might not have heard about us. Um, and it also looks like that we, uh, you know, honestly, I'm, uh, I'm bummed that no one else wants to use this time to pick your brain because, uh, I'm, I'm sure that you guys could probably charge a, a hefty hourly rate for one-on-one -on -one consultation. 
<laughs> I mean, Jeff, Jeff, you could have plugged Meta fans more, though. I mean, you left that Lollapalooza and the Preakness yeah, and I Dolphins was, games and Cubs was, games and football pools and squares and jeez. I was I'm about, to, a, I'm I was about to add to it. <laughs> yeah, I like to leave people want. I'm not a big chiller. I feel like uh, the uh, the proof is in the pudding for us. So um, I appreciate it, Doug. You uh, talking about some of the other stuff that we're doing. But honest, uh, honestly, I I really truly believe that when I say the proof is in the pudding, if you go into our Discord and you say hi and you, you say you came from the trade the chain Twitter space, um, you're gonna get showered with just a lot of love and a lot of people that want to help you get to know about who we are and what we do. And that's, that is the most beautiful thing about the community that, that we've been building. Uh, sure. I think people, I think you, people come for, Oh, I can, I can win $250 in a, in a, in an NBA pick em weekly league, or I can win 500 bucks playing squares pool, or I can go to Wrigley field, or I have the opportunity to go to Lollapalooza, whatever it might be. That's why people come, but people stay because of, like just the the vibes in the community and the relationships that they're building and that they're 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 making both you know friends in the digital world but because we're so tied to in real life experience they're making they're making real friends too people that they're going and grabbing beers with and grabbing dinners with and expanding their circles and their networks and it's a beautiful thing to watch happen organically so yeah um, yeah it was a uh, it was a beautiful thing to 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 hear you guys talk about how your community just helps one another and, and how we reiterated that, you know, the old way, the new wave becomes the old wave and, and that cycle comes through, you know, it was beautiful that we held a, a space about mental health last night. And, you know, afterwards, uh, one of our members that, that came up and talked about his story, you know, we, we, you know, we really came together as a family and, uh, and, and helped him out in, in our, in our, in our discord. And, you know, some other members even blessed him with one of our NFTs because he is in a bit of a pickle to where he can't, you know, necessarily invest, but we, you know, our members are so gracious enough to, you know, to, to offer him, you know, a piece of, uh, a piece of our artwork to, to really, really be in our community. And that was very beautiful to see, um, you know, it's, it's unmatched. And, and that was because you guys made him so comfortable that he was able to really just open up, which was just amazing to listen to. Uh, I was stunned. It was really awesome to be part of that last night. Yeah, we were uh, we were truly blessed to be able to to have the opportunity to be able to hold this kind of that that kind of space for for others, and we definitely uh, plan to you know carry that on and and you know keep making that safe haven for for everyone, not just our community members, but for you know anybody that decides to join us. Yep. I mean, we, yeah, we love sports um, and we love, we love music and uh, we love all that good stuff, but um, you know, village takes care of the village. That's, that's what I always say. And uh, the, the community we're building around all the good stuff that we're doing is what's going to, what's going to make us, you know, stick around for, for the long term. And we've, we've got a lot of cool things up our sleeve and I've got a lot of crazy ideas in my head <laughs> that I'm, that yeah. I'm, just now getting out onto onto paper along with uh with Lil Chuck who uh is uh our our fearless leader so it's uh it's going to be fun times ahead and uh I'm excited for for folks that are going to be jumping on the bandwagon with us um sports pun intended <laughs> <laughs> love, um, it, love it love it yeah so um I think uh Again, no one has called up, called themselves up to, to want to ask any questions or anything like that. So what I will say is this has been uh, an awesome chat. I've learned a lot. I, I do think that everyone else in here has learned a lot from, from you guys. So we really appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy days building what you're building to come impart some of that knowledge on our community and your community and some of the others who's, who've trickled in as well. And I hope that we can continue to, to do this kind of stuff together. Um, I, I love how this empowers, you know, both of our communities. And, uh, and for the rest of this week, from a MetaFans perspective, um, we're chock full of things that are coming. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be with Paul Garino, who is a sports agent who represents uh, athletes across um, MMA and fighting, uh, NHL, NFL, you name it. Um, he'll be on. That's going to be an awesome conversation with some news to share as well from a MetaFans 
perspective. And then on Thursday, we're going to be with one of my good friends, Troy Osinoff, who is at yo on, uh, on Twitter and at Troy on Instagram. He is very much a, a crypto and blockchain and NFT OG um, and is going to, I think, drop some serious knowledge uh, on, on all of us and is someone that you should definitely follow. And, uh, and on Friday, we'll be chatting with our partners at the party tour. If you saw, we just uh, released our announcement about our exclusive uh, NFT sponsorship of the party tour. That is going to be an amazing uh, golf slash music slash um, art festival that it's inaugural one will be taking place in South Florida. And then there will be more touring around the country. We're very excited about that. Excited about uh how many meta fans we're going to be able to put there um, and how many tickets we're going to be able to give away to that um, experience wise. So looking forward to all of those. And that is all leading up in culmination to Sunday where we are going to be in Chicago for our exclusive meta fans party at Wrigley field. Yes, sir. Which is going to be a banger. Um, we will have open bar food DJ after party after the game is over merch pop-up store silent auction giving back to the rizzo foundation um lots of good stuff all happening in the 1914 club inside of wrigley field i am currently working on having the wrigley sign outside of wrigley field saying welcome to meta fans nft a lot of good stuff coming so um we hope that you continue to tune in with us check out our discord check out trade the chain leverage all the amazing technology that they have uh, that they are now putting at your fingertips and uh ryan anything else on your end um rigging field is my happy place uh i'm i'm super jealous of everyone getting to go to that uh that that super bowl party that's a lot of fun and uh i hope to see everyone uh in the meta fans community at some point in the not too distant future at some uh at an event where we can uh we can co-host between trade the chain and meta fans thank you so much I mean, so much for uh, having us on this uh, on this Twitter spaces. We're we're honored to talk to your community. Appreciate it, Ryan. Nick, thank you. Doug, thank you. Any other parting words from y'all? Uh, no, I just want to say thanks so much for uh, for everybody listening, taking the time out of their evenings. Um, time is our most valuable resource, so always appreciate that. Um, and I look to do more sessions like these with you guys. It was so much fun. We yeah. appreciate. We appreciate Agreed. you totally guys. Awesome for thank you guys. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.